Uh, very good morning to everybody uh, to us this morning. Uh, we have a very esteemed panel on the wine industry. This is our 14th session looking at uh, different value chains in the agri-food, the agri-beverage, agri-fiber industries, uh, where we look at uh, the complexities and the competitiveness of our different value chains. Uh, it's, we do this so uh, people have a better understanding of how these value chains operate, how important they are to South Africa and the asset that we have in our agri-food, agri-beverage, agri-fiber system. So today it's a pleasure to, to welcome onto our panel um, two wine farmers specifically, Hein Kuchlenberg from La Motte and also Bayer Stritter um, from Bayer Kluf. And then we have Marina Kello from Wines of South Africa. She's, it's our sec her second visit to us. And we appreciate that, Marina. And then also Rika Basson, who's the CEO of Vimpro, uh, representing the wine farmers uh, of South Africa. So we have a panel that is that covers the, the value chain very well. And so a hearty welcome to you. Obviously, the wine industry is currently under a prohibition on sales. Uh, while exports are continuing, uh, pretty much 50%. And then also with the tourism aspect, they are suffering huge pressure at the moment, and a lot of work is being done to uh, to get the the ban on on liquor sales and trade lifted, so that we can reach the full potential again of the industry. And I'm sure that our participants, our panel, are going to go into that as well. So I want to I want to start with the farmers, and I'm going to start with uh, Bayer. Uh, Bayes, you've been in the industry so many years and you've done a lot of work within the Pinotage group. And I want you just to give a sense for how the farmers are coping uh, with, it, with the current ban and what the problem is with it. And, and uh, do we still have time uh, to turn this around? Thomas. And then I most probably have to start with the farm workers. At this stage, you know, for three and a half, four months, we couldn't sell wine. So uh, what's happening is that the grape growers that take their wines to the cooperative or to a place where they have to work their, their grapes over into wine, uh, they are not going to get the money they have to get. The sellers are full. Uh, People like myself and I that buy wines from, from specific sellers. We haven't sold wine for three months, so we're not going to buy. We're going to buy 30 40% less, and that's going to have a huge impact on the sales of wines. Wine prices have dropped by 30 40%, and I think it's even going to drop more and more, and eventually it's going to reflect on the payments of the farmers. So I, for me, I see a big difficulty for farmers. Farmers most probably will lose quite a lot of farmers. Riku most probably will, will talk about that later. But my biggest concern is the farm workers. You know, if guys sell their farms or they just, I, uh, there's a lot of farmers that don't even prune. They just leave 50 hectares without pruning, without working, because they can't pay wages at this stage. Now it's going to have a huge, huge impact on our farming community. In this process. Uh, Hannah, I want to get to you. Do you, you want to add in terms of the, the impact on the livelihoods uh, in the industry and, and, and how our farmers can overcome the, uh, the, the, the constraints and the challenges that we have at the moment? Uh, I fully agree with uh, with Bayes. We are sitting with a huge problem, uh, and the problem that we are facing is we have too much stock. Uh, and it's it's at the moment. If you take example of red wine, for instance, uh, I, I will sell this year or the the next twelve months probably fifty percent of the wine that I budgeted in uh, of the vintage of 2018 that I harvest in uh, 2018. Uh, I'm selling at the moment vintage 2018. But I probably will have 50% uh, uh, too much stock of 19 as well and of 20. So the problem is it's it's a uh, it's we, we're in a long term business. So when we do planning on a wine farm to plant the vineyard, 
I need to know how much wine will I sell seven years from now in which market. Then I plant and I make sure that I get the stock. So if I don't plant for the and, and I just buy, uh, I need to buy three years ahead. So I need to know how much wine will I sell around the world three years from now, and then I harvest accordingly or I buy accordingly. At the moment, I am sitting with, with one vintage too much stock in my system. Now, from a cash flow point of view, that is like huge. That is amazing. The problem now further is <clears throat> it is added value stock that I'm sitting with. So to do an easy calculation, if I bought the wine at <laughs> the grapes at 6,000 rand a ton, that, that goes to about 9 rand a liter after you've made wine. Now I've added seller cost to 10 rand per liter, all depends on the winery. A winery at La Motte, I will add 10 rand, and a cooperative you probably will add 5 rand a liter. So then, then you're sitting with, with, in my case, I'm sitting with 19 rand a liter of stock, added value stock. Then I've added wood to that, and then I'm sitting at stock valued at 23 rand a liter. The bulk price at the moment for that stock, if selling, is anything from between 8 and 12 rand a liter. So will I sell that stock? No, I will not sell that stock. Now, what, what's my options? Now, my options will be then in 2021, I have to skip basically a full vintage, not, not, not harvesting anything. So if I don't harvest next year, I will have a problem because what, what, what will happen to my vineyards? Uh, what will happen to the farm workers that work with me? Um, so it's, it's and, and that's now directly only the vineyards and the planning around the vineyards. Thank you, Ayn. That's very useful to, to, to get an understanding of the complexity that we have with the, um, the stock and the, uh, and the problems that we have with the vineyard management, et cetera. Um, Rika, I want to get to you uh, because it connects to the farmers uh, and we get, we're getting a good sense of, of the problems that the farmers are facing. Uh, you work with all the farmers. Uh, give us a sense of, of how, how broad the problem is and, and, and what the uh, implications are going to be uh, if we don't get the ban uh, lifted soon. Yeah, John, thanks for the opportunity. And I think uh, both Bayes and, and Heinz already touched on it. So, so whilst, we, whilst we're battling at the moment and working with urgency to lift the ban, um, that's not the only thing we need. We need to stabilize the sector. Um, but it's not a sector with huge margins. I think uh, our own research show that it's for some uh, farmers very marginal. In actual fact, before COVID, 30% uh, of producers didn't make a profit at all. So you can just think for yourself what the impact is on the segment if um, Heinz numbers uh, are correct, and I think they are, that um, the price of wine and the price of grapes will probably go down 40%, 50%, which, which suddenly puts a whole industry into turmoil. And you, you almost want to use the word, if you don't balance it, it can implode. Now I, now, I know we throw around a lot of numbers, and I want to get Bay, back to Bayes. In, in the current context of South Africa, where we talk about billions and millions, and it might seem that when you say 22,000 jobs, uh, it doesn't, in the context of millions, uh, sound like a lot. But we're talking farming here. We're talking rural segments here. And what we know is when you lose a farm job, in a rural community, you probably lose five or six dependents on that job. Um, and I think that is a, that's a massive issue when we talk farm workers and rural safety and rural stability and a humanitarian challenge that we have. So that's the first thing I want to add to Bay is that I'm really concerned from a socioeconomic impact. I'm not sure that our government partner always realize that what stability needs in a long term industry. Um, and, and therefore, in the case of wine, we keep on saying it is an agricultural product. Um, I've said a month ago, and I think it's, it's, it's worse, we, we risk to overnight lose 
20% of the players in this industry, and that means about 80 wineries. That means close to 400 producers. Um, and, and people will say, well, smaller is better, but John, and I differ with that argument. Smaller is not better um, because you don't want to end up with an industry with medium and large players only. Um, we risk losing great projects like old vineyards. We risk losing some of the niche players who really makes us interesting when we sell premium wine out there. So, so yes, we need to reopen, um, which we can talk about later. Then we need to urgently, and I can share some of our solutions for 300 million liters of stock. That is a third of a harvest that sits in tanks. And, uh, and then we need to long term talk about the regulatory framework within which this industry operates because there is a huge anti alcohol sentiment. And we need to find a balance um, to, to create that certainty. So, yeah, I'm just adding to what the previous speakers have said. Thanks, Rico. We're going to get to all those factors still around the regulatory environment and the uh, the, the, the behavioral change around the alcohol that we spoke about yesterday in one of our meetings and all those. I want us to, to, to bring those up. Morena, I think you've got your work cut out for you. You've got to sell our wines overseas. Uh, and at the moment, that is our only market that's open. And um, we've heard now that there are um, some exports going and that, that uh, seems to me July was a bit better than, than usual, but we, uh, we really need to get our wines moving. What is the market like on the outside uh, to get both bulk and bottled wines out and, and perhaps also give us a balance of the, uh, of the between bulk and bottles and what the, what the demand is? John, uh, thanks for having me again. Um, the situation outside is it's quite interesting. Uh, as we have experienced issues here in South Africa, so have our competitive markets. And I think it's safe to say that uh, the likelihood of uh, the Europeans also seeing uh, excess wine stocks is, is certainly there, which will have a, a global impact. Um, they have, of course, not had the same issues uh, on their on their locals. Have, um, but what we've seen is through a really good campaigning and media. There's been a lot of, um, from consumers to purchase South African wine, and uh, there are there's a group Save SA Wine, which really is quite heartening to follow, uh, to see people from all over the world purchasing whatever South African wine they can get their hands on, which inevitably uh, leads to additional orders for exports from South Africa, which is great if you have that, that line to export to. It is, however, the, the, the locals who don't have that export uh, opportunity that we are concerned about. So, in terms of the market, uh, we've we've seen great exports. We've seen uh, 38 million liters being exported in uh, July, which is very very positive. Uh, it definitely is is a lot more than we have seen for quite some time, and the situation at the port is certainly clearing up, which is which is positive. So I think we we need to remain hopeful that this will continue, but uh, I think the challenge that that we face is uh, the, the prices that will inevitably be pushed down, and this is something that we have been fighting so hard to to change overall. Uh, up until uh, now we've seen the split between bulk and packaged wine of 60 40 and this is also something that we've really wanted to change around to really swap around to see more more packaged wine go out really to position the value of south african wine and and our, our premium product which is so good especially in these european markets um so it, we don't want to say that all the hard work will be undone, but I do think that this is not something we will see the result of 
right now. I think this is more of a long-term uh, issue that we will have to keep an eye on and uh, hope that the positive exports uh, figures that we have seen in July will continue for the next few months at least. Um, that is very helpful. Uh, I'm going to come back to you uh, just now. Uh, Bayers, I, I, I want to ask you, one of the, the things that has struck me of the wine industry, and you've been at, at the head of that through the Pinotage uh, Foundation and the Pinotage um, Working Group and the, and the uh, prizes that you give every year and so on, is, is that our quality has improved considerably uh, over the uh, past 10, 20 years. Perhaps you can elaborate on, on the efforts that have been made by the wine industry to ensure that our quality and that we can sell at a premium uh, internationally, because I think the competition is pretty tough out there and you can also elaborate on that. Uh, as we get into um, uh, the, the Argentinian wines and the Australian wines and the New Zealand wines that we have to compete with, Perhaps you can just elaborate on that because I don't think there's always an appreciation for the work that goes into, into, into producing our quality wines. John, thanks again. Uh, it's, I'll speak from a, from a Pinotage perspective and I think I include then Shiraz, Cabernet, Merlot, Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay. I include all varieties because, you know, some people think I only drink Pinotage. I actually drink a lot of other wines and I love brandy and I love whiskey and I love gin. So I love beer. So if we talk about alcohol, I think a lot of times we forget there's other players in the market also. So I personally feel for every, every part of the alcohol people that sell. I mean, a lot of people don't even know you make, uh, uh, you can make gin from wine. You can make brandy from wine. So I feel for those guys also, but there was a tremendous growth in quality in the South African wines, and I'm above board. I think if I talk about Pinotage, the first competition we had in the 90s, uh, the first top 10 that we had, I, I would have said there was only four top 10. Six were in, but they most probably didn't make the grade. The last top 10 tasting that we had last week, 32 wines of the 150 entrants were above 90 out of 100 points. So it just showed you the quality raise. We raise the bars completely, and that's all the other groups, the Sauvignon Blanc group, Shannon group, Merlot group. They work hard to, to uh, uh, market our wines and also to better quality. And the interesting part is that with the quality boost that they were, the prices went up. I mean, you will see Pinotazes above 500 Rand all over these days. And that's the same thing with Cabernets and other varieties, but that also changed completely. People where they thought South Africa was only value for one, money wines, and we still, I, we still produce the best value for money wines all over the world. But now we compete worldwide with the best wines of the world. We can compete with the best Bordeaux, the best Burgundies, the best uh, uh, Shirazes in the world. We can compete. And that's, if you have a look at the international wine shows, I mean, just the international wine show in, in London, that's used to be one of the better ones, international wine and spirit competition. South Africa has won the competition for the best wine five or six times. And that's amazing. I mean, so you can go to other competitions. People don't look down at South African wines these days. They look up at us. So uh, there was a tremendous change and it was a huge effort from a lot of individuals in the, in the wine industry. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I absolutely uh, love our South African wines. I'm a Good wine drinker myself, uh, and and uh, it's it's uh, what you said. Value for money. There's no doubt that South African wines are a cut above the rest. I want to ask Hein, um, what 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 does it take for a winemaker to 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 improve our wines? Where does it start? Whether genetics, whether uh, the the vineyard management, etc., the the maturing and everything. Just give us a sense of how much effort and how much science goes into 
into producing these quality wines? I, th I think, John, it's definitely a combination of things that happened. And over the many years now, uh, South Africa, uh, we invested from a wine point of view, vineyard point of view, in planting the vineyards in really exciting uh, areas. Uh, that was not available for us 20, 25 years or 30 years ago. Uh, but if you if you feel now the wines and, and taste the wines of, of Elam, for instance, that was not there um, 15 years ago. It's it's a new region, and it's only one of um, plenty that we have. And then we come up with with site specific areas, the old vineyard pro projects. Uh, I, I think from from a vineyard point of view and and a planting point of view, we we really invested in planting exciting areas. Now you start making wine from those exciting uh, vineyards. Uh, then you'll taste it in the wine. So that's one component. The second component, uh, originally we were a cooperative driven system where the wine farmers will leave their wine at the, at the big cooperative and then uh, they make the wines and and then uh, we bottle the wine and, and, and you sell the wine to the consumers. The past 15 years now, we sort of generated uh, celebrity winemakers. Now, Bayes probably will be the old uh, celebrity, uh, but but he was he was uh, uh, one one of the older ones. But there's plenty at the moment, and and what what we created in South Africa, by chance maybe, was fingerprinting style uh, wine uh, making uh, personality. It's it's a combination of things. It's exciting. It's not it's not a million liter tank wine that you you drink uh, some bottles of. You invest in in the personality, and we have plenty of the personalities around uh, in the industry at the moment. So, from just to add with Bayes, we we are in a, a a total total different situation than ten or fifteen years ago, from an industry point of view. Obviously, we don't get the money yet for the quality that we produce. And I know the industry and Rico is working really hard in getting the perception, because it's a perception also that you need to create, uh, that we are value now. We are really good value. But please pay for the value. Don't get it cheap. We all have to work that we, we sell more expensive wines and people People need to value the value of South African wine because of what we have done the past 15 to 20 years as an as a industry. Absolutely, I can just uh, absolutely enforce that. Uh, I, I, I am so impressed with the way the wine industry has developed. Uh, and I want to agree with Rico. I don't think smaller is better. I think we need to build a bigger critical mass of our industry to get more shelf space internationally. Uh, I think there are so many opportunities. I was in China last year in, at, at, uh, uh, in uh, Hangzhou uh, with Alibaba's shop and, 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 and they, they massive uh, wine selection there. And there were just too few South African wines there. I, I, saw, I saw only two or three bottles. I think there's so many opportunities that we, that we can still penetrate in our markets. Uh, because we have this uh, quality price issue that is absolutely in our favor. Rico, I'm going to come to you now. Now we're getting to more, perhaps the more difficult ones, the, the, the ban and what we're doing about the ban and how we addressing the ban. And, and uh, perhaps you must give us a bit of a sense uh, on, on, on what the strategy is and, and how things are developing. Uh, you, we were part of meetings yesterday, and uh, I think it's important that we also communicate what we're doing and what the discussions with government are uh, at the moment. Yeah, John, thank you. I, I think it's um, to say it's complex is an understatement because we deal with uh, with a with a government partner who is not always fulfilling the partnership role in terms of communication and, and support. So that's the first thing to, to say out bluntly. Um, I think the challenge with COVID has been that communication often uh, broke down and it frustrates the industry who wants to make a difference. And, and then uh, you need to deal with, with the sentiment of your members who uh, 
there is a point where when you tell them you are negotiating and deliberating that they just don't believe you anymore. Um, and uh, and I must say, whilst there's this understanding for for the first ban, I think the second one uh, came as a shock. Um, and, and, and we were really disappointed, not because of the decision, but the way in which the decision was made. Uh, because leading up to that announcement, we were really in positive deliberations with with commitments from the industry. So, so now we're in week four um, of a ban, and and I think the numbers once again do matter because we are losing 400 million rand per week, um, and every week that goes by, that builds and builds and builds, and the industry exponentially then uh, goes into uh, a position where it really retrenches jobs. And, and we see that. We see we see companies going into formal retrenchments now. The tourism segment uh, really came into to a halt. So, so the decisions we had to take is, uh, firstly, we, we uh, considered the legal option because uh, you get to a point where you negotiate, but unless your, your partner is willing to engage with you, the court the court might be an option and, and we can come back to that. So we, we gave it and we got an opinion around that. Secondly, we decided that there are a couple of things. Firstly, you need to short term get this unlocked and, and I'll come back to that. But secondly, when you reopen, you need to make sure that you stay open because what we might have is that we open in a week's time, but uh, for whatever reason, there is a spike again and we close in a month's time. So you 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 want to you want to safeguard your reopening. And then thirdly, um, given a world of regulations, you want to make sure that you get into a far better regulatory environment where the industry accepts its responsibility, but government also accepts that this is a two way street. And so, John, what we've opted for is, is to not go the legal route, um, uh, purely because our opinion was that it can be a very protracted, uh, uh, a long process. Um, there is a court case that was made by some of the producers, and we can touch on that um, as well. And we've, uh, with other partners, uh, decided on a social compact, which, which really is a formal agreement between government, industry, labor, as to how we will mitigate this. And, and this includes short-term um, commitments on volume restrictions, um, which will phase out as we reopen the economy. It includes a lot of um, commitments on harm reduction, but it also includes a collaboration, what we call a, a war room, eh, where, where there is a far better flow of communication. So, so when there is a hotspot in a certain region that we can mitigate that by, by cutting back on volume supply, or we can address it with interventions. So, so I think that's where we are. I think um, that's what we call the net lack process. Uh, yourself were very instrumental there. Um, I think it was 10 days of very good negotiations initially far apart, ultimately got together. And where we are now is we've got a consensus document, which is currently being lobbied um, with the NEC in terms of getting the political buy in and the will um, to take it forward. So it's difficult to give a commitment, although I am positive that we could fairly soon see the reopening. Um, I think it will be different, although we're pushing hard that we at minimum get what we had on the level three before. But it will probably go back to four days as we had nine to five. Um, we will see some volume being curbed and then a far more targeted approach around around this. So, so in, in essence, John, that's where we are. And then we also for the very same platform are looking um, to address the medium longer term things. Um, and there are some wild allegations in terms of minimum pricing and minimum drinking age and uh, just selling wine and bottles and not boxes. All of those things are being discussed um, and need to be part of the way forward that the short term compromises that you make don't become the long term new normal, as we often say. Um, so, so yeah, 
it's 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 very complex and i think my members don't always understand why i can't give them a ball to ball day to day update um it it is you deal with a government who looks different they make decisions different uh your your relationship with your minister of agriculture is now different because she doesn't have the mandate of yesterday and uh and yeah that's just the sense of of, of the way we see it and, um, and and we try and stay calm and keep everybody on board and and, and uh, be responsible. Uh, thank you, Vika. I, I'm living also in this process and it is complex and we do have a lot of support from all the social partners in NEDLAC, even from certain government departments, a number of government departments, but it's 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 not easy because we've got to get this got to get the political buy-in from the national command center. And we know that there are certain ministers there that that have different views to other ministers, for example. And so we we are also working hard to get that unblocked as soon as possible. We are pretty hopeful, uh, given the developments with the with the infection rate, etc. Uh, and also the need to get the economy going because we are uh, damaging our economy immensely. Also around the the excise uh, duties, etc., that uh, that our, that government is losing in the process, and we can somebody can touch on that as well at some stage, because I think there is a balance somewhere, and that and that's got to be struck pretty soon. Moreno, I want to get back to you uh, on the on the exports and. Uh, I mean, the, the industry is under immense pressure, and uh, we uh, perhaps also looking longer term. How do how do we get more wine out uh, on a competitive basis? I know this is a huge challenge for you, but what do you perceive as the as the as the barriers uh, to to marketing our wine uh, overseas? And I'm, and this could be infrastructure; it could be anything. Uh, what do we need? Uh, how we have the opportunity. I was in discussions with Transnet, the senior people in Transnet, Transnet yesterday, the head of operations, head of, of strategy, and they are so keen now to work with us. It's a totally new team at Transnet, the executive team. And so we're getting an opportunity to, to position with them in planning. Uh, and I think they, if, we can, if we can get our infrastructure and our logistics working more competitively, uh, we are going to, to to also bring down, reduce the costs of doing business in the process. Yes, John, I think certainly uh, good relationships with Transnet is, is a good place to start. We had a very fruitful and positive discussion with the new uh, CEO of Transnet Port Terminals, Valili Dube, a few weeks ago. And uh, it is very clear that they are doing whatever they can to try and sort out the issues that are being experienced at Cape Town Harbour, which is really the main harbour that we as the wine industry use for our exports uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, I think Hein mentioned earlier that the quality and the perception of South African wine has certainly changed uh, over the past few years. And I think that's really made a big difference in, in the way that consumers perceive South African wine. Up until not so long ago, especially in Europe, there was the perception that South African wine is cheap and cheerful. And therefore the wine that the consumers would buy off their uh, local supermarket shelf uh, would generally be in a say sub, sub eight uh, pound category, sub eight euro category. And the reality is that actually if you just move into that 10 to 12 euro pound uh, category that really the, the quality of wine that they would get in the bottle compared to most other uh, mark, wine from most other uh, competitor markets is, is really very good. Um, and, and that's something that we as Wines of South Africa continuously communicate um, not only to importers, but wherever we can to, to the consumer, to, to make them understand that actually when you buy this wine, you're buying a quality product um, and, and do look over and above that, that lower end price point. So what I think uh, needs to, to happen is very different in various markets. Uh, the Chinese market has a lot of potential for us um, but there are constraints to, to trading within that market. 
um, a lot of people do continue to, to uh, put pressure on the fact that our competitor markets of Australia, New Zealand and Chile have free trade agreements with China and that does impact on us. Um, I think that would definitely make a big difference for us. But there are other elements to consider with, with that kind of thing, as we all know. Uh, to, in order to, to put a free trade agreement in place, there needs to be a mutual giving and taking. And uh, I don't think that what the, the Chinese government want from the South African government, we're necessarily willing to give away at this point in time. So there are sensitivities around that. Uh, America as well is, uh, has got so much potential for us. However, again, the constraints around the three-tier system that, that are in place there does make it very, very difficult. Uh, along with perceptions from the general uh, American consumer on Africa, uh, and 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 those are those are discussions and and uh, 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 education that needs to form around those those points in uh, along the value chain. I think. Um, I th I I don't think that we're doing too badly, considering uh, the fact that up until now, up until 2018 we exported roughly 50 percent of all the wine that was produced here in south africa last year it went down by roughly 100 million liters to 320 million liters of wine that was exported out of the country uh, and that is simply because there wasn't any stock this picture is obviously going to change now um and and we need to to push as much as we can i do think the way that we're going to be doing business henceforth is going to change significantly uh, we haven't been able to do the trade shows that we've done uh, normally in a normal year. However, I do think that um, one of the good things that have come out of this is the fact that people have realized that you can do business online on a video platform. And to send samples uh, is certainly a lot cheaper um, than getting on a plane and, and spending a month in, in Europe and away from your business. So I think there are opportunities and, and we're likely to see uh, positive uh, things that come out of this. But um, again, I think I mentioned in my session on Monday, the words cautiously optimistic, and I will stick to, to, to my, my thinking in that regard. Um, but uh, the perception of South African wine is positive. And I think that's a good base for us to start from and to grow from. Uh, so I don't think uh, we have too much to worry about in that regard. Thanks, Marina. Uh, I, I'm uh, both to you and Bayes. Um, I think tourism is such an important part of the wine industry and the part of the experience and the personalities. And, and, and by chance, I've actually been to both of your wineries uh, and I've even hiked here at the, in, the, in the mountain at the back of La Bort, you know, that trail there. Uh, so it, it, for, for, and, 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 and the tourism industry has also been badly hit. Perhaps you can just elaborate on how important it is connecting the wine to the restaurants and the tourism industry, et cetera, the experience that we get out of that because in South Africa that is quite unique with the environment the mountains and and everything that we have in our wine industry yes yes John uh, I think uh, you are 100 percent correct uh, uh, from uh, from a tourism point of view we are in the tourism business we are in the wine business yes but I think um, over many years now we positioned ourselves as probably around the world the best wine experience from a tourism point of view uh, and you can go you can go to france and italy and australia um, and california and then you come back to south africa and you can you you go to wineries and you cannot imagine the variety of experiences that you will have and the quality of that variety of experiences at different wineries now um, from the classical music uh, all all around down to to horse riding, you will find all the different experiences that people connect with the, their brands. Uh, and unfortunately, now my restaurant people, the waiters at the moment, are doing bottling for me. 
So I cannot open the restaurant uh, fully. I have um, only open on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I cannot sell wine in my restaurant. So I have 40 waiters uh, that do the bottling at the moment for me. Yes, I, I unfortunately have to not use um, uh, people um, that, that part-time people. So I, I use my own staff now. And, and yes, they are willing to work. When will we open again for tourism? I don't know. At the moment, if I look at, at uh, over a weekend, I go to Franzouk, it's like a ghost town because the restaurants are closed down. Will we open uh, the restaurants again? Maybe 50% of the restaurants will open. Um, have I have to look, relook at my whole model? Yes, I am busy relooking at my whole model of tourism that I offer. Uh, it's just too expensive uh, to keep and, and you don't use it. When will tourism, um, I'm talking about international tourism, come to South Africa again at least 12 months? I cannot see be before 12 months from now. Um, local tourism at the moment, we can't even travel in provinces. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the people around my estate that please come and visit me. And yes, they do. I get my 100 plus people on a weekend uh, still visiting uh, their estates. Unfortunately, they cannot buy wine. So I think from a tourism point of view, uh, we were in, in probably the best position around the world from a wine industry. Um, how will we recover? I don't know. I, th I think we have as an industry really need to sit down from a tourism point of view and, and relook at the steps that we need to take to make sure we can we can get back to some sort of where we were. Um, because we will lose a lot of infrastructure uh, along the way now. Um, and, and, and to rebuild that will not take one or two years. It'll take much longer. Yeah, thank you, and I think it, 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 it is a huge concern. At least they have now uh, reopened for intra-provincial uh, tourism or, or moving around for leisure. So uh, that, that does open it, but it, it's, really the, it's really the wine experience and uh, the, the, uh, lifting the ban on, on sales of wine, which is really important. Uh, Bayes, any, any, any comment from you on, on, this, on this matter? I know I've been to your restaurant and, and so I always enjoy sitting there. Um, comments from your side? Um, uh, I, I think wine tourism for the last 15 years was most probably the most exciting part of the wine industry. It, it grew by out of, so as an Afrikaans sal sê, uit sy nate uitgegroei. En is fantasties om een plaas te besoek met alles daarom. Mense gaan by, people take you into the vineyards, they show you how to prune, they show you a lot about the vineyards. And people, local people like it. They come to Bayer's Kloof or to Kanokop or to any farm that I can mention, uh, Heinz Farm, and they want to see. And that's part of your marketing. That's part of your marketing budget. And I also don't want to lose that at all. And uh, unfortunately, the same as Franz Huck, if you go to Stellenbos at night time, it's a ghost town. We'll most probably lose 50% of the restaurants because they want to recover after this. There's no way they can recover. And a lot of people don't want to come to a farm, eat at the farm, but they can't drink a glass of wine. So the tourism part and the industry part is going to change also. You know, you can still take people and show them the vineyards because you can stand two meters apart from each other. But I'm not going to a restaurant without having a glass of wine. And I mean, I propose to the office of the president said, please, let's open and just sell wine per glass. Because a lot of times if I go to a restaurant, I buy a bottle, I most probably can drink a bottle, but I don't want to drink a bottle. Now, being my age and young, I want to prove I can drink a bottle. So I will have the whole bottle. I'm not going to leave with a small bit of bottle. It's like lacquer. It doesn't look that well if you leave with a small bit in the bottle. But have a look at older people. I'm talking people in their 80s. The husband and wife come into, they have, they, they must buy a bottle, so they buy a bottle, but they leave with half a bottle because 
They paid for it, so they have to leave with half a bottle. If you serve per glass, they can have their glass each. And what happens if, if you buy a glass of wine in America, you pay for the whole bottle. So, and a lot of restaurants make their, uh, their money out of the wine and the liquor part. So all of a sudden now, if you buy per glass, you can, you can make up some expenses. Even if you buy a glass of pinotas at Bayer's Group, you're going to pay 40 rand. Two glasses will pay the bottle. So uh, uh, there's a lot of ways we can do it. Even in, my, in the office yesterday, we spoke, and my marketing guy said, if somebody comes to the restaurant, they must show you the designated driver. And the designated driver is not going to drink. Or he must show that he's going to Uber. And that will help a lot of road accidents and whatever. But, but I'm very concerned also, like I and Riku and Marina, about our, our tourism part of it. And we create a lot of jobs on that. And people, our people also, they're pruning and whatever. And if this goes on for another two months, I think we're going to not only lose 50% of the guys, we're going to lose 70% of it. And just if I can add, I have to thank Riku for all the work they're doing. And when he touched on it, it's only not communication, Riku. It's representation of all agriculture sectors. If we need much better representation, the wine industry, the alcohol industry, sheep, farming, everybody, we need the representation. And after this, we need to fight for representation in the government to uh, hear us what we want and what the farmers really want. So I'm very adamant about that. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much for that, Bayers. I, I fully agree. Uh, I must just say that Rick and I are working pretty closely, or very closely, uh, on through the NEDLAC process and various platforms to, to get things and Rico has done a fantastic job uh, for the farmers there. Uh, uh, so we're working with, obviously with the whole alcohol industry, uh, broader to uh, et cetera, the distributors and also to Rico, I want to get to you and, and, and around the regulatory environment and some of the discussions that we've had around behavior changes and and uh, and, and Bayes actually alluded to the issues of uh, drink and driving and, 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 and so on. Um, Perhaps your thoughts on, on what you see that the regulatory environment perhaps changing or, or uh, the pressure that you are under from government around the regulatory changes. Just expand a little bit on the on the on the regulatory environment. Yeah, John, thanks. I don't know why I get all the complex questions and the others can talk about tourism. Um, yeah, just the just the sentence on tourism, you know, we, we can, can all I, can, can I interrupt you there? You sit in the hot seat. You sit in the difficult seat, and you get paid for. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll I'll give you an answer. Now, just just the context on the tourism. You know, the tourism part is is really the ace that we that we've had. I mean, it's world class. We we tend to 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 undersell ourselves, but it's also the glue. It and and we talk about wine and we talk about things, but. And for and for the smaller wineries, John, and, and 80 80 percent of our wineries are very small. Uh, the tourism part is they their way uh, to direct sell, and then we can touch on innovation later. So they don't all export; uh, they only export a third. The rest is in terms of direct winery sales. Um, back to the easy question on uh, on regulation, then. Um, uh, you know, in, in twenty in twenty fourteen, for the first time, we sat down. I think in the same netlag on the amendment bill, and that amendment bill um, had a number of uh, interesting curveballs in it. Amongst others, uh, minimum drinking age, uh, zero percent on uh, on road minimum alcohol levels, uh, banning of advertising, all of those things. And um, and I think through that process, we we got to an agreement with government. That this is not the way to address alcohol in South Africa, um, and I keep on saying it. Not all South Africans drink alcohol. In actual fact, sixty percent of South Africans do not drink alcohol at all. They abstain totally. So when you do a survey like we do, and you ask South Africans, should the ban remain? And sixty percent say yes. It makes sense, doesn't it? Hey. The problem that we have is that the remaining 40 percent, 
um, has got a challenge and a societal problem with alcohol and, and within that there are most certainly pockets of problematic things and, and and so the way to address a problem is not uh not to go ban because we can learn from the prohibition in 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 america in the 1920s all that all that happens when you do a ban and you stop the regulated channel is that a number of other things like a black market illicit trade comes to the fore um, there is a point where law abiding citizens just don't give a damn and they break the law um, and they bootleg and they do other things. So the way at the moment which government uses to address the problem will not solve the problem um, because you can only solve the problem when you identify where it is and you address it with your targeted approach. So, so what we've said is there are four things to address. The one is let let's collectively address drinking and driving and i think bayes rightly what he says are this are the solutions that we will bring in to say the industry can self-regulate it has shown that it can self-regulate we can enforce um from ids to ubers to a breathalyzer test if you want that at bayes Kloof. um but let's not have a ban and let's talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room are pedestrians. A lot of the, lot of the alcohol things are not motor cars, it's pedestrians. And, and there is no regulation around that. So let's resolve that. Uh, but let's have a zero tolerance approach to this. It's a problem, let's fix it. Um, number two, youth. Youth and alcohol is a problem. Um, there's binge drinking within that. You can only resolve that by on the one hand, ask for IDs at Bayes and La Motte's restaurant. Everybody, uh, even uh, as young as Marina or as old as me, should show IDs. Um, but also education, John. It's an it's an education thing where where we we've got programs in schools. Unfortunately, certain provinces do not want that that education at school level, which which is mind mind boggling. And then gender-based violence. So there are a number of things which one could unpack. Great solutions. It's backed by industry funding. Um, it just needs middle ground on that. So, so no, I am against the way that government is approaching the problem at the moment. It is not going to solve it. It is going to drive the, the, the illicit sector underground, which means no revenue. It means that people are making concoctions which is poisonous and people die. Um, so, so that's what we need to resolve. The, the way forward, let me not point fingers. I think um, the industry need to sit down urgently and rethink the way it operates. Um, and whilst we've got wonderful premium products and, 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 and the things that Hein and, 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 and Bayes, uh, their model is the premium model, it's also a fact, uh, John, that we still sell a lot of wine very cheap. Um, and, and we need to talk about that. Should we sell wine in plastic containers? Should we sell wine cheap? And I, I do think it's not necessarily the packaging, but we need to talk about the minimum pricing. And, and it's something that we need to get across. It's very difficult now with a surplus to talk about phasing out, but but I think John, this this is what leadership is about. Um, it, the, so there's an opportunity out of the crisis to get make the industry better. It is a world class player. Um, we've got the tenacity to bounce back, um, but that that needs assistance and that, that needs collaboration. So so let me stop there. I think. That's part of the arm wrestling, but the way we address the problem uh, should be totally different. Yes, thanks. I think the fetal alcohol syndrome uh, problem is also still still on the table. So there are a number of behavioral changes that still need to come in and that can be effectively driven by a responsible regulatory uh, system. And I think this is where the conversation still has to go. I think what is positive, though, is uh, and I want to mention it here, and Rico has been very much part of that, is that the whole liquor industry has actually come together to create a platform for more 
and better dialogue than what we've ever had before uh, because of, of the ban. And I think, I think there's a greater meeting of minds, there's a greater understanding of the problems in the, in the, in the broader alcohol industry and how we need to address those. So I think that, that has been, to me, one big positive that has come out of the, out of the crisis. Now we've just got to use that properly to position, uh, position ourselves and represent ourselves properly at government. And I think that uh, we, we, already made, we have already made great strides uh, in that uh, positioning. Okay, so we're getting towards the end of the discussion. I think we've touched on most of the main things, but I'm going to again start with the farmers. Uh, my heart is always with the farmers. I come from a farm, grew up on a farm. Uh, most of my family are still in farming. But I want to, I want to ask you guys uh, for any parting comments, any messages that you want to get out either to the public or to the government or to your fellow uh, wine farmers, sort of a parting message. And uh, uh, Bayes, let's start with you, uh, the, your last word. Uh, John, uh, first of all, thank you. And thank you to everybody that spoke today. I, uh, from my side, you know, our farmers have always been sturdy guys. They've got fast bait and they can go. And I just wanted to tell everybody, please just stay on the farms. Try to survive and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, and we'll be there. I think also, like you said, is the industry is going to change completely. Marina said it, the way we sell wine, what we do, but I'm also always positive. I think there's light in that, uh, in this tunnel in the end. So thanks that I could have been part of it. Uh, thanks, Bayers. It's always good to see you. The last time I saw you was on the ship on the way to Mozambique. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> we had a good time. Uh, also with the ship's captain tasting the wines and the Italian wines. Uh, you might remember that well. Uh, Ayn, um, a word from your side. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, uh, I think uh, we as an industry must just stand together and we are we have a system uh, of different wine routes, uh, tourism routes, uh, uh, Stellenbosch, uh, Franz Huck, Paul, Hermanus, uh, all of them. Uh, and, and, you know, we, uh, we as a regions have to stick together and we have to support each other and make sure we will survive. As Bayer said, we are Burkis. We will survive. Uh, we need to, to take as many people with us that we survive. Then we need to understand our new consumer and the way to communicate with that new consumer going forward. So I think that, that's a, a, a topic, maybe totally a new topic, uh, because the communication towards your new consumer will probably change, uh, and also the consumer will change because he, he does have less money, and, and maybe uh, the language must be totally different from where we have used to be to talk to consumers. Then back to tourism, I think, uh, you know, we have to really work hard as an industry to make sure that we get our tourism offering back to the state that we had it. Uh, we, we are at a really special tourism uh, experience, um, and let's not lose that. Uh, we even if we have to um, plead to the government to help us, uh, because that's part of South Africa. That's part of South Africa's tourism offering, uh, not only the wine industry tourism. So, um, thank you for for you and and everybody um, that is working very hard at the moment to make sure that that uh, we get open, uh, we get our products on shelf, and and at the end. It'll be a long process as long as we stick together. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think it uh, there will be a bit of a changed environment. They will the consumer will change, and there will be changes. There's no doubt about that. I think uh, Morena alluded to that just now already in how you're marketing, etc., how you're communicating with the consumer. So, Morena, perhaps a closing word from your your side to uh, interface with the consumer in many cases and your perspectives and last word, please. Absolutely, just to echo um, what Hein has just touched on in terms of tourism, from an export perspective, it is incredibly important as well. Uh, it is inevitable that anyone visiting the beautiful winelands here in the Western Cape from wherever they are coming from in the world, returns an ambassador and they are the ones who spread the word of the quality and the beauty 
uh, and the amazing experience that they've had. So they will be the ones to buy wine in their markets and uh, introduce their friends and family to South African wine. Uh, so the value of that is 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 incredible for us. Um, and then also just to to again touch on collaboration. I think collaboration is key. And if there's one thing that we can take away from this experience is that uh, by working together, we can certainly uh, achieve great things uh, as an industry. I'm fortunate enough to be included in the communication stream of the wider alcohol coalition. And it's the first time in the history of our country that the, alcohol, the wider alcohol industry has worked together. And it really has been an eye opener for me to engage with the teams from SAB, from Heineken, Diageo, Pernod Ricard, and, and to represent our industry on that platform has, has been a, quite an honor as well. Um, but to get these people who have knowledge, who have experience, to come together to, to work on the social compact that is so incredibly important and needs to be taken forward um, for the long term. This is not a COVID-19 issue. This is a long term issue that we all face here in South Africa. So that's been amazing. And then lastly, I just want to leave the conversation by saying, you know, there's no doubt that South African wine it can stand up next to the best of the best in the world. And from our perspective as export marketing organization, that is certainly the narrative that we will be focusing on whenever we promote South African wine in our key international markets. Thank you, Marina. And I can just absolutely echo your words. I, I think, uh, what you have said now is really important. So thank you very much for that message. Rico, you have the last, last word. So uh, you can close. And, and, and give us your perspective on where we're going and what we're doing. And, and, yeah. and I like the message from the farmers, hang in. Uh, farmers are a resilient bunch. They, they, can, they can take the knocks and let, let's hang in. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. And I think it, it's probably sooner than later. Uh, Rika, your last word. Thank you. Yeah, John, uh, firstly, I want to say uh, thanks for taking my call still at 10 at night. So uh, uh, to keep on keep on doing that, uh, I think you must say, what, what does he want now? So... Uh, and, and thanks for your role. It's been great. Yeah, look, I, I want to touch on collaboration, and I think that's that's probably been the the best thing out of this. Is is we we prove to ourselves that when we focus on the same problem and solutions, that we can work together. Um, and then often the industry tend to be fragmented. I think that's been brilliant. Secondly. The support from embassies, international importers, as Morena said, has been amazing. Um, and it really talks to South African wine as a, as a product. Um, we're going to work very hard, John, um, and, and push very hard um, daily at night to, to get it open. I, I'm still hopeful that that is sooner than later. And then we are really, really um, working on solutions to get the surplus stock out of the way. I think um, people don't like to hear it, but we're probably going to make hand sanitizer out of Pinotage or Cabernet. We're going to gonna distill a lot of the wine. We, we are going to sit down with government and ask for assistance. I think there's no way that the industry can export 9 billion rand of wine and get 1 million rand support. Um, so the stimulus package. So we are crafting what I call a disaster recovery plan. Um, you should rather call it uh, winning, winning with wine. I think disaster doesn't sound right. Um, but John, I don't want to want to say it's going to be easy. Um, I think it's tough. I want to acknowledge the producers. I want to acknowledge the workers. Um, I work with trade unions every day, and they are in full support. But it's painful. And um, so we need all the support. So if you want to help, you go on the website uh, of Lamotte and Leopard Sleep and Bayer's Fluff and you order two cases of wine. That's a good start. Um, and Hein and Bayer's will deliver as soon as we open. So that's my closing comment. Thanks very much, uh, Rico. Yes, and I'll, I'll, I'll be first in the queue there. Um, Right. I, I think this has been an absolutely great discussion. I'm really encouraged to hear about uh, the innovation that you're bringing into the industry in terms of marketing, Rico. 
uh, and and how we deal with the with the surplus, etc. Et uh, I think this is very good news, and I think we must engage with government as soon as possible. Uh, also, with that, I think it's that those are some very good suggestions. I want to say thank you to 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 each one of you, to to, to Bayes. Uh, I've known you for a few years. To Hein, uh, Morena, we've met quite. Uh, twice this week already, so that's been very good. And Rika, we obviously have a working relationship spanning a number of years, and and uh, I know that the that the industry leaders and that the industry is in good hands, uh, and we are all hopeful that we will we'll get this ban lifted. Uh, the, the the signs are very positive. We ourselves have also been working very closely with the trade unions, and they have backed us very strongly in trying to lift the ban. Uh, in in uh, I, I can say it with all honesty that. Tony Ehrenreich and I, he's my counterpart at NEDLAC, and he, he has supported us from day one and put a lot of pressure on government around this. Uh, so, yes, we are working with the labor unions as well and with and, and with the Department of Trade and Industry, Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, Rural Development, various Department of Labor, etc., in trying to get the, the ban lifted. And uh, they are basically all supporting us. And, and now we've just got to get the final decision uh, from Cabinet, basically. So I want to say thank you to you. I want to wish you well. I really want to 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 wish all the farmers out there well too, and all in industry. And uh, we we've got to survive this crisis. It is a global crisis. In a way, we have managed certain things better, but there are certain things that we have not managed that well, especially around the economy. I do worry, but I think we we do need to do, to social distance. We do need dispersion, and we do need. Uh, uh, to, to manage this disease as responsibly as possible, because we can have uh, kickbacks or uh, second wave attacks, but we must also get the economy going in a responsible manner. So thank you for your participation and Godspeed.